Father, I pray today for everyone who will be under the sound of my voice uh, here or by YouTube later or, or sharing it by email with other people. Lord, I pray that you would convince us of the truth of your scripture. I pray that you would bind and break and rebuke that corporate spirit of religion that keeps people from stretching into the fullness of God. Lord, I pray that you would send a new baptism of your Holy Spirit, that you would make the church alive and well again, that you would create in the church a hunger for the lost and a, a thirst for righteousness and a willingness to get off the easy chair and take a step into action to, to do what needs to be done to change our, our church and our world in Jesus' name. Amen. On March or in March of 1912, while developing film and waiting for the process to complete, Miles picked up his Bible. It had just fallen open to John 20, and he found in that chapter the story of Mary's coming to the garden to visit the tomb of Jesus. As she looked in the tomb, her heart sank because Jesus wasn't there. He, standing nearby, spoke to her, and she recognized him. Her heart leapt for joy. And Miles imagined that he was present that day in the garden on that glorious occasion witnessing the wonderful event when Jesus met with, with Mary. And his thoughts returned to this when he started working in the dark room again. And he was gripping his Bible and his muscles, according to his own recollection, were tense and vibrating. Reverently, he thought, that is not an experience limited to a happening almost 2,000 years ago. It is a daily companionship with the Lord that makes up the Christian's life. And thinking about this, he wrote a poem. He later said the words and phrases came quickly. That same evening, he composed a musical setting, and in doing so, he gave us a world that, that the world uh, knows in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. During his latter years, Miles said, if I can make it through March, if I can just make it through March, I'll live another year. Well, in that March 10, 1946, the winds were blowing. He didn't make it that month uh, through that year. But his song carries on. So number one, does God still speak? Does God still speak prophetically through modern day prophets or even through common folk like you and me? People who do not believe that God still speaks claim that the gift of prophesying really means preaching. And some pharisaical uh, fanatics say prophets are only misguided fortune tellers. The Bible does not support that false thinking. Other believers and theologians say God still speaks, but only through the Bible. I was indoctrinated into that cessationist thinking by some of the most fervent soul-winning churches and preachers of the 80s. They adamantly taught God no longer speaks, period. Sadly, I was deceived by the strength of their convictions. I did dismiss the sentimental thoughts and songs like In the Garden. I actually refused to sing and he walks with me and he talks with me. Praise God, my eyes have been opened. Praise God, my spirit has been opened. Praise God, I'm doing stuff that I said I would never do in, uh, anymore because I know, I know that I know that I know that he walks with me and he talks with me. But praise God, it took a three year period in my life where all hope was broken off and everything, I, I just wandered without hope. The most obvious uh, proof that God was still there is that he still loved me enough to spank me. And oh, how he spanked me over that three year period. Car accidents, losing my insurance, and on and on and on and on. Because God needed to take drastic steps to bring me out of a false teaching of, of the doctor, I call it the doctrine of demons. Cessation is a doctrine that some spiritual gifts, including prophecy, speaking in tongues, and healing, ceased with the end of the apostolic age. 
Cessationists believe that Holy Spirit no longer gives these uh, gifts to Christians in the same way as he did before the original apostles died. Now a question I have to ask today, how can that be because Jesus Christ is the chief apostle and he certainly isn't dead, praise God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Cessationists list, um, they also believe that the offices of, of apostle and prophet were only in operation until the apostle John, the last of the apostles, died. They believe that such things ceased when the last apostle from the New Testament was no longer on earth. Their doctrine was developed during the Reformation, Martin Luther's Reformation. It's particularly uh, associated with the Calvinists, the Presbyterians, and, and people that go that way of thinking. And it's all the work, I believe, of, of Satan. Number two, the corporate spirit of religion makes the church powerless. It is a sign to either keep people from getting saved or to present believers from moving into the fullness of God's power. And I don't know, uh, maybe somebody else can tell me, I'm not sure if this is a spirit or a principality. But if you look at how many Christians and churches have a form of religion that denies the power of God, denies even the power of God to radically save people and transform society, it's obvious we are up against a formidable foe. This isn't new. This was true way back when, when the apostles walked the earth. Um, in the early church, 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. The apostle Paul uh, compared such men to the wicked magicians who opposed Moses in 2 Timothy. Now as Janes and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these people also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, for they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs was also. Now that doesn't mean they don't have huge churches. John MacArthur is one of the worst of the worst of the worst that teaches damnable doctrine. He charges 360 dollars to go to his conferences for one week to find out that what the Bible says isn't truth, though he uh, dominantly says that, that his cessationalism is true. But it's not new. There are many churches and denominations who teach against and or forbid spiritual gifts listed in the Bible. They insist tongues and interpretation, healing, deliverance, and power ministries were only for the early church. Someone re recently says that, that he disagrees with my theology because I commanded healing over a prisoner whose back was healed. My response was, I want you to read these last verses in the Gospel of Mark. I turned them open in his Bible so he would, he would know that I hadn't changed them. I said, read these words. And he, Jesus, said to them, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will, not, will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. He didn't limit that to the first century. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I asked him, do you want to take scissors and cut these verses from your Bible? He didn't want to. But later he, he observed while I helped a new convert hear the voice of the God for the first time. He listened to me, he said, this is miraculous. Well, it is miraculous if you step out of religion into the power of the living Christ. Now the same man asked me to help with tough cases. He said, will you come over, will you help me with this, will you help me break this, will you help me do this? Please pray for him. Start to pray for those people who reject the word of what the word of God says because religion gets in the way. Question for you. Number three, did Jesus mean it when he said, if anyone hears my voice, Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice 
and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Even cessationalists use this verse in soul winning. What do they believe it? Does Jesus speak to the hearts of those he calls to open the door and believe? I remember the altar call when Jesus spoke to me of my need to, of salvation. My heart was suddenly com convicted. It was pounding inside my chest. And I realized I was hellbound and needed to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. I needed to believe in my heart and be saved. My life and destiny changed at that moment when I responded to the voice of Jesus. Number four, faith comes by hearing Jesus. And I didn't look up, uh, look up the verse, 1 Kings 19, 12, but, but God speaks and when we hear him and respond, it changes our life. I was converted, you were converted, when you responded to Jesus' still small voice speaking to our spirit. John 5, 24, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into, unto life. Misguided cessationalists teach that the only way we can hear God's voice is listening to the Bible being preached or read. Why then did the Father, Jesus say the Father would send another comforter as the same kind as, as himself to remind them of what he was speaking to them when they went through traumatic times, John 14, 26. Paul said faith comes by hearing, not by reading. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, of course, the Word of God it is what he speaks. It's also what he's spoken in the Bible. And, of course, faith grows as we read the Bible, even more when we read it out loud. Our faith grows when the Bible is shared with us. But it's not enough to say, to, to, to hear what Jesus said to us. We need to hear what he is saying to us. Pam and I got married in 1993. The next year, by the, it might have been the same year, she said, could I do devotions when you do your devotions? Could I do them with you? I was thrilled. So we started reading the, the Bible back then. It was together just once a year. Now we do the Old Testament once and the uh, uh, New Testament twice. But something about hearing it read she reads her five verses, I read my five, and we go that way back and forth. But hearing, the, hearing it read has developed a faith. I, I, I think if, if I was going to be reading the Bible my own devotionally, I would read it out aloud because hearing comes, uh, faith comes by hearing. Saving faith comes when we hear Jesus speak. Listen to this. Conquering faith comes when we receive and obey what he is speaking to us. If you want to conquer, conquer uh, have conquering faith for your marriage, then you need to receive and you need to obey what he's saying. You want co conquering faith in your job, then you need to re receive what he's saying and obeying it. Probably you've heard it and several times it's taken place. Missionaries have gone into pagan lands and found tribal people who have been born again have a true faith and they have never had a Bible, never a preacher there. But God spoke to them and they were sincerely born again just because of the goodness of God and they listened to that still small voice within them. Part of that is what is decreed in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 and 20 that talks about that, that the wicked who suppress the truth by their wickedness are subject to the wrath of God because God speaks to everyone through the voice of creation and the voice of conscience. But get this, faithful general godliness comes through studying the written word of God. You can do, develop a good theology on the written word of God. John the Baptist told his disciples, the words of God speak. Now that was given before any of the gospels were written. Paul shared similar thoughts, 2 Timothy 3. But you must continue in the things you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise 
for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And you probably memorized 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that means teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, training, discipline, and righteousness. But catch this. Please catch this. Faith for specific assignments comes through the voice of God. It's worth repeating. It's a funny story. There was a man that thought, I, I need to turn my life over to God. I I'm so depressed. I I'm just about ready to get up. I just want to die. So he opened his Bible, and, and the first verse he came to was, and Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> what? And he flipped the Bible a couple, couple more pages. And that, that what you doeth, doeth with haste. That's not a good way to read the Bible. But how do you know, how do you know God's will concerning your career, or your marriage, or your ministry, or what school you put your children go to? Ask Pam. When I asked Pam to marry me, she had no desire to be married again, at least not to me. But she promised to ask God and let me know. I don't think I ever prayed more intensely d than I did during that period until she told me her answer. It was a voice of God that told her yes. Once she said yes, I, I, I suggested, how about next weekend? She just su suggested, how about in a year or two? And at the time we were both reading Oswald's Chambers, my utmost for his highest. Pam at her home and me in the church par um, parsonage. One August day that year, unbeknownst to each other, we were both moved to read the devotion for December 12th. That was 1993, August of 93. God highlighted that text to show us the perfect date for our wedding, 12, 12, 93, and nine plus three equals 12. We didn't understand the governmental significance of the two 12s in that number, but God did, and he made us husband and wife, according to what he had said on um, December 12, 1993. The funny thing is, at the time, I didn't think God still spoke. I knew that Pam believed that God still spoke, but I figured everything God wanted to say was, still in, was written in the Bible. Although I was excited that Pam thought she heard about December 12, and the verse, it was a section of John 17, 22, that they may be one just as we are one. She heard his voice. I'm so glad she did. I'm so glad she obeyed it. Number six, my sheep know my voice. When Pam and I were in Israel, we saw hills, mountainsides really, dotted with sheep. And shepherds would take large, uh, large and small flocks of sheep into the same big pasture area and let them mingle together all day long. And then at the end of the day, the shepherd would, would yell at a sheep and his sheep, each one's sheep would come to the shepherd's voice. Everybody in Jesus' name, name they knew what Jesus was saying. The shepherd calls, they recognize the voice and they follow him. Well, that was so neat. Soon, there's going to be a voice like the sound of a trumpet call. And that voice is going to say, come up here. Just like it said to John in chapter Revelation 4, 1. And those who hear his voice will come forth from the dead, even the grave, as surely as Lazarus came forth when Jesus told him to come, come forth. Wow, God. God help us to get this. Jesus said the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Something that amazes me, Pam and I are living in abundance. There's no way you can explain that. There's no way you can explain that. There's no way physically or financially. 
We're living in abundance because Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Just a few verses later, he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall one, anyone snatch them out of my hand. Did he mean that? Of course he did. But religion works hard to steal this promise from us. Let's return now to the text in John 5. Are you getting this? We need to say no to religion and yes to the Spirit of God. Number seven in your notes, the saved dead will hear his voice and be given life. Wow. Again, as sure as, as Lazarus heard Jesus' voice and came forth, forth from the grave, so will every believer one day, except those who are alive and they'll just be caught up. But thankfully, think of this. Have you ever wondered about this whole, whole horrible? I was helping plan a funeral yesterday in Mishawaka. Can you just imagine that? And John 5 says, uh, what I thought was, have you ever thought of when your spirit is taken out of your body? What's at the moment of death before the mortician has a chance to lay hands on you? Aren't you glad for that? I don't want some man undressing me. I don't want to be there when I'm being pumped full of fluids. The moment, the moment he calls us. John 5.25 most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he granted the Son to have life in himself, and given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Now here's an interesting thought. Number eight, the unsaved also will hear their vo his voice but their destination will be different. Do not marvel at this, verse 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Can you imagine those people who have refused to confess Jesus Christ as Lord before men? Can you imagine those people who have said, I'll get to it someday? Can you imagine those people who have died without Christ hearing the voice of God and waking up to hear you're condemned and being sent to a Christless hell? That's what's going to happen. Number nine, like Jesus, we must be hearers and doers of what we hear. John 5.30, Jesus speaking, I can of myself do nothing. Jesus speaking, I of myself, Jesus was God. Jesus is God. I of myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judges, judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own but the will of the Father who sent me. Some parents nag at their children, repeating commands over and over and over again that their children ignore over and over and over again. And that's not a kid problem, that's a parent problem. Dare I say that? That's not the problem with the kid, that's a problem with the parent. Parents that say, I'll never spank my children. Well, your kids will never obey you. The only way to mature in hearing God's voice is to obey what he says, regardless of how soft or how loud. James 1.21, Therefore lay aside filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. Receive with, with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now he's talking to people who are born again. So what does this saving of the soul mean? It means bringing your mind, your will, your emotions, your identity under what the Word of God says instead of believing all the lies that the world has said about you. And I'm going to read the verse again. 
uh, receiving with meekness the word of God which is able to, to save your soul. Number 10, four steps to hearing God's voice. God spoke directly to Adam and Eve before, uh, uh, until they fell into condemnation and, and deception. He spoke directly to Abraham, to Isaac, to Mo Moses, to Noah, to all the Old Testament and New Testament apostles and prophets. He gave the entire book of Revelation to the apostle John while he was banned or um, he had been taken to the island of Patmos. He spoke to Martin Luther, and the Protestant Reformation was launched. He spoke to John Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed, and he spoke to you when you were saved. You were convicted by his voice and invited him to receive him. Jesus is the Word of God. His Word is alive and active because Jesus lives in us. And though his words may not be audible, they come as God thoughts, not to harm us, but to give us hope in a future. David Mathis said, hearing God's voice gets to the heart of what it means to be human. Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Now I'm going to, I found somebody that said this better than I did. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking it from an article by Meg Butcher in Crosswalk.com, April 22, uh, 2021. But she gave these four steps, and I, I changed them a little bit. But step one, discern God's voice through Bible study. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness. I have already read this verse, an overflow of wickedness, but receive with meekness the implanted word. That means a word that gets into your gut, that changes your life. I began reading the Bible through once a year in 1977, or it might have been 1978. But reading took on a whole new uh, life when Pam and I began reading it out loud together. I remember, and it shocked me as much as it shocked the, the man. The man was giving in to condemnation. He said, oh, God's never going to... And I just said, well, I know God better than that. I'll tell you, if you're in the Word, there comes a place where you just know God so well that you know deception when it's before you. Jesus got up early in the morning to walk and talk with God. Pam and I do our devotions with our very first cup of coffee every morning. Joshua 1.8, how does it say it? Do not let this word of the Lord depart from your mouth, but meditate therein day and night that you may do according to all that is written in it, and then you will, you will have success. Uh, Psalm 1, I think it's verse 3, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night, and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in, his, in the season and will not prosper. God says if we go beyond reading to meditating on the Word of God, that is going to change everything in our lives. It promises success. I, I guess that's one reason that, that Pam and I are as blessed as we are. God says if you do this, I will do that. And he's done that. Step two, discern God's voice through others. Can you imagine what a mess we would be in if our body parts did not communicate with each other? I would be terribly sunburned if my body did not tell my brain to put on a hat and wear sunscreen. I do not believe a Christian can be strong in the Lord and in the Lord or indeed apart from the Lord body, the ecclesia. There's no way my brain could type messages without the agreement of my fingers. We need each other. We need to hear God's voice through preachers, through prophets, through evangelists, teachers, and apostles. We need to hear God's word through other believers. God designed us to walk in wise counsel. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Jeremiah 23, 18. But if they had not stood, this is God talking, had not stood my counsel, see the capital M for my, and had caused my people to hear my words, 
then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I don't know if you know it, but there's an Evangelicals for Harris group. There are Republican Women for Harris group. They err in that they do not know the scriptures. They err in that they do not know the word and the voice of the, God, of the Lord. Job 15, 8. Have you heard the counsel of God or do you limit wisdom to yourself? Or Psalm 89. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly feared in the assembly or the council of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. We have looked at the, the words counsel, count, spelled with a C-I-L or counsel with a S-E-L from the Hebrew. And as just speaking of groups of like-minded people who counsel with the Lord together. I have it in your notes. God refers, God refers to the, the counsel of the saints. I forgot the word counsel there. Those who follow God together, we must reason together with the Lord. I'm reading the most fascinating book I picked up at a garage sale, sale for a quarter. Those Who Dared to Think by Themselves, it's, it's edited by, by Sid Roth, but it tells a, the, the story of ten Jewish people who were brought up in the strict Jewish faith, the Talmud and all that, all that kind of stuff, and they started having a hunger and thirst for them to know the real Messiah, Jesus Christ. Fascinating how they heard the voice of God and they had to find Christians to find out what the scripture was saying to them. We've got some questions. We have a homeless gal that came here a couple weeks. She hasn't been back since. Last Sunday I found one of her, a, a shawl that, that Suzanne bought her. This morning there was, I didn't take it off to see what it was, but a, a skirt, it was, Pam said it was a dress that Suzanne bought her was tied to the front doors on the handle. And a lot of you have been praying for her. How do we know how to help her? And she's just a sampling of the hundreds around us with similar problems. Somehow we need to talk together with the Lord to, to find these kinds of, kind of answers. Uh, step three, oh, I forgot to read Isaiah 117. Is that the trumpet of the Lord? It can be because we're still here. <laughs> Isaiah 117. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, if you are, You'll eat the good of the land. Step three, discern by looking for the good. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, those who by reason of use, because they put it to practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Hannah Anderson wrote, as we seek truthful things, we are forced to confront our own falsehood. Step four, discernment rejects perfectionism. True discernment rejects perfectionism. God calls us to be faithful, not perfect. Too many people give up because they make a few mistakes. Nobody will ever make more mistakes than I've made. But I'm not going to give up. Why should you? Pretty much faith is use it or lose it. Step four, discernment rejects perfect perfectionism. Do not judge, do not judge others, do not judge yourself according to your appearance, but judge with a righteous judgment. Same verse amplified. Be honest in your judgment. Do not decide at a glance 
superficially and by mere appearances, but judge fairly in righteousness. Same, same verse from the uh, Passion Translation. Stop judging on the superficial. First, you must embrace the standards of mercy and truth. And that gave me, brought me to one more verse. It was a verse that God gave me before Pam and I married. I think it describes her and me. It's Psalm uh, 85, verse 10. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Isn't that what God wants for our marriages, for our homes, for our life? That the good in each other comes together to make a strong, strong team. Well, I want to wrap up because as late as in, in 1995, I walked in deception. I was already at Sturgis. We were growing fast. We were having a good time. But I was in the deception that God no longer spoke to people. Now, I believe God spoke to Pam because I knew she wasn't a liar. But I, I couldn't understand it because I didn't believe that was a practical thing for everybody. And we were doing cell groups back then, and I took several people through the equipping track written by Ralph Neighbor. Well, he had one section in the second part of, I can't remember, the Believer's Guide, and the, second, the last one was the, um, it was a longer name, uh, the arrival kit was what it was called. But he had a section on, on listening to the voice of God. And by that time I was praying, God, I need to hear your voice. God, let me hear your voice. And he suggested that you sit down with a notepad. I can't read my writing. I used a computer. But you sit down and say, God, speak. Your servant is listening. And then wait for thoughts that come into your mind and write down those thoughts. Because they might be God thoughts. They might be God speaking. Why well, determine, and I'm a very determined man, I determined I was going to hear God speak. So I made a vow to myself. I would, five minutes every day, I'd sit at my computer. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't open my eyes very open at least until I heard his voice. So I'd set my clock five minutes to 10. Well, no, 9.56. Gotta be time, 9.57. It seemed like hours. And I probably did that for two or three weeks before thoughts started flowing to me. Now it's a joy. Every morning, every night, I just say, God speak, I'm listening. And he gives me thoughts for sermons, for life, for, for different things. If you're like me, don't give up. Keep doing it. If it takes you three weeks before you hear that little, first little word, son, daughter, I love you. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Do not give in to the cessationist uh, error. Do not give in to the corporate spirit of religion. Do not let the devil steal from you the truth that you sing and may not believe when you sing, I come to the garden alone and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. He wants every person to enjoy that kind of a relationship. And even if you're proud and stubborn hearted and religious like I was, if you keep at it, He's going to release it. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we don't bind the corporate spirit of religion assigned to this church, really assigned to this pro property for decades, that wants to keep people religious and righteous in their acts, but not have the power of God to conquer temptation, to hear the voice of God, to speak to demons and make them leave, to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Lord, we ask you to rebuke and break the power of the corporate spirit of religion off us individually, off this church, Lord, off this property. 
we ask that you go around the boundary lines and purge it of all poison as far down as it goes. And Lord, release the newness and the baptism of your Holy Spirit upon us that we might know your voice, recognize it more quickly and more surely. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up for the blessing? I bless you with the promise of faith that he does walk with you, that he does talk with you, that he does show you that he's, you're his own. I bless you with the ability to risk listening and discipline yourself until you hear clearly. I bless you with words. This is prophetic. There's words that's going to set some uh, young people on a whole new course of life because you're going to hear, you're going to know. You're going to know that the calling that God has in your life and that when you answer that calling, you'll finally be into the fullness of what you've always longed for. And I hear for the marriages. We all go through dire straits. But there's one whose still small voice sets the path of victory and completeness. Lord, I speak that you will keep the thief from stealing, killing, and destroying marriages, but that you would make marriages abundant in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak for this church. It seems sometimes like the harder we try, the smaller we get. Well, Lord, we ask that you would release words to us individually and corporately that would break the walls that keep the people from coming or keep them from staying. Lord, your counsel is wise and your counsel will change things completely. So Lord, bless us with the knowledge that you're ready for new things in Jesus' name. Amen.